I met him seven years ago at a paella party here in DC. A mutual friend, like now a mutual friend, invited me and who's with along with my now wife, who's like our like started dating, invited us to a paella party where I met where I met our next speaker. So it was a very nice fortuitous night. And he's now a New Yorker. So he moved up to New York. So I got, and I still see him more often in DC than I see him in New York. So we had to, we had to fix that. Um, and I was going to tell an embarrassing story, but I won't. It's not embarrassing, actually. All right. So you might have noticed this, folks. He is a great political scientist and data scientist. Yet the New York Times ran an article about him, about a party he was throwing, like he's a nightlife impresario. So everyone, let's, let's ask him questions about that, all right? But his fun fact is that he was, who knows the stand programming language for Bayesians? Raise your hands proudly, right? Who uses it? Fewer people, right? But you want, who wants to use it? Everyone wants to use it, right? So he was one of the first 10 people to post on the stand help list. So he's an early adopter, a true hipster, using it before it was cool. Everyone, please welcome David. Uh, hey everyone, uh, thanks for uh, coming to listen to this. I'm gonna talk about data science and US politics and you know how uh, data science is used by campaigns, at least on the Democratic side. I have to admit, I don't really know what the Republicans do. We don't hang out that much, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, if you know anyone, I'd love to meet them. All right, so I'm just gonna talk about, uh, so I'm the co-founder of Blue Rose Research. I'm gonna talk a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, we are a roughly 30 person firm. We exclusively work with democratic campaigns and progressive groups. Uh, you know, my co-founder and I were alumni of the 2012 Obama campaign uh, and their analytics team, which was, I think, really kind of the first, the first, the first campaign that uh, I think they had like a something like a 50-person analytics team by the end of the election. Uh, so our team is an even mix: software engineers, machine learning engineers, and client-facing analysts. Uh, we had over 100 clients this cycle, which included most outside groups in the progressive space, uh, and spanned uh, a lot, uh, hundreds of House races, Senate races, governor races, state executive races, which includes things like uh, Secretary of State races in places like Nevada or Arizona, and uh, also lots of state legislative races, which we're incredibly proud of. Uh, in terms of what our shop does, and I'll talk more about this later, we focus a lot on forecasting elections, helping groups allocate money, uh, predicting uh, behavior, and testing content. Uh, in terms of what that entails, we've conducted literally thousands of RCTs on millions of people. I think the exact number is maybe like 14,000 pieces of content on something like 13 to 15, 14 million interviews. Um, you know, we generated probabilistic forecasts for every House, Senate, and governor race uh, in the country, as well as a lot of other things. Uh, when, and in doing this, uh, we scored billions of rows per day and also helped allocate uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in spend. Um, so, you know, how does data actually get used in campaigns? I just want to talk through, you know, some of the core questions. I like to joke, it's a boring, unromantic way to think about politics, which is that politics comes down to what do you say, uh, where do I spend my money, and then how should, well, like, what, what do I say, what's happening, and then how should I actually spend my money? And so what, I, what, what politicians say, and this is like a big part of what we do, can really take a lot of different forms. You know, what policies should your basic campaign on, what ads should you put on the air, what talking points should I circulate to the press, and the reason this is hard is that in politics, if someone sees an ad or hears a speech and changes their mind, we have no way to know that because there are no tracking pixels in people's brains yet. I don't know. I, I'm sure someone's working on it. Uh, and so that means in order to figure out what works and what doesn't work, you really have to do uh, lots of experiments and you have to survey a lot of people in order to uh, figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, you know, prior to you know, the rise of this kind of experimentation, you know, people would look at engagement. Like you could just put a bunch of ads up there and see what people click on or see what people spend the most time on. But unfortunately, the only people who engage with democratic content are highly educated liberals. And if you choose what to tell swing voters uh, on the basis of what excites highly educated liberals, you might have a bad time. Um, so over the course you know, of the uh, last six years, you know, we've built a large scale uh, experimentation system that's allowed us to test thousands of pieces of content. And when we've done that, uh, we found that roughly one in five uh, advertisements that we tested made people, that we tested with the intent of persuading people to vote for Democrats, actually made people more likely to vote for Republicans, um, which is bad. 
Uh, and so for a long time, you know, our big theory of change was find those ads and don't show them to people. Uh, and that, you know, plays a big part in what we do. Um, another big, uh, another big part of uh, politics is just really trying to measure changes in public opinion, which is very hard. Um, you know, public polling has really never been super accurate, but it's really been, uh, it's been wrong in really important systematic ways in 2016, in 2018, in 2020, also in 2022, as I think a lot of people here were surprised about, um, uh, you know, at least with the election results. And 2020 was actually so bad that it was actually the single uh, worst year for polling in something like 40 or 50 years. Uh, and if you can't really measure what's going on, then you can't really do anything. And so we've kind of pioneered a new approach to doing polling, which is involves surveying very large numbers of people uh, and doing uh, legitimately sophisticated statistical modeling, which I'm going to get to in a second. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, so that's that's just a big part of what we do uh, in terms of why it matters. Like, why is it that campaigns have to know, you know, what races are close? Uh, obviously, we all just want to know who wins. But intrinsically, campaigns, you know, campaign interventions are not super effective. If you show someone like 100 ads in the two weeks before the election, you know, that will increase their chance of voting for you by maybe something like 0.8%. And lots of elections are much closer than that. And so it's very valid, but it means that you really have to concentrate your spending in places that are close and you have to have a good sense of the joint probability distributions of outcomes in order to actually get, you know, the best, uh, get as much out of your money as you can. Uh, and then, you know, that just kind of parlays into the next thing of how do you actually spend your money, uh, which is that campaigns, uh, you know, spend an enormous amount of resources. I think total spending in US politics is, uh, was on the order, I think it's on the order of like $8 billion. Uh, and most of that goes into TV ads, and it's a very complicated question to figure out exactly what mix of uh, spending across mail and canvassing and television and digital uh, and across all of these complicated media markets will actually go and get you the most votes. So just to talk about why this is hard, um, the first thing is that politics uh, is really complicated. Um, you know, voting behavior, what, something I really like about this job is the thing that motivates uh, why people do what they do, even though there's a lot of math is fundamentally, it's fundamentally something that comes from sociology and history and a bunch of other things. And I'll get to some specifics toward the end of this talk. Um, but basically why people vote the way they do is really driven by a bunch of complex factors, things like ethnicity or income or education or religion, many of which are difficult to directly measure and many of which interact with each other in a variety of complicated ways. How important those different factors are uh, really can vary uh, across space and time. And uh, unfortunately, surveying people is expensive. Uh, and so it's uh, important to do a variety of different kinds of pooling. The other thing that makes this really hard is that survey takers are really, really weird. Um, uh, this, is, this is, I think, probably the core reason why polls are ever wrong, is that uh, is basically survey non-response bias. If you look at a phone poll today, only something like one in 200 people uh, pick up the phone. And, you know, that one in 200 person, like answering a phone survey at this point is now more correlated with whether or not you vote than past administrative vote history, which is, which is just an absolutely wild thing. Uh, and so it's really, there used to be this world where you could have a political science grad student, and he like runs out MRP on like six variables and generates reasonable estimates. And that era is basically gone. You know, at this point, you really, need to survey very large numbers of people, you need to have a bunch of proprietary third party data, and you have to do pretty sophisticated modeling in order to actually, you know, generate reasonable estimates, at least at the accuracy that's demanded for in politics. And then the last reason why it's hard is that, uh, you know, our business decisions are very sensitive to autocorrelated error. And so what I mean by that is, you know, when we fit models, uh, you know, our basic workflow is that we survey, uh, we survey a bunch of people, we fit models, and we score the voter file. And, you know, if there is, there are certain parts of the country, my favorite example is in 2018, there was a district in uh, southern West Virginia, West Virginia third, where 80% of the population were registered Democrats. Uh, but only, uh, I think, on, uh, Biden, Joe Biden only got like 30% of the vote there. And, you know, there's like a bunch of complicated historical reasons why that's true. But if you just fit some simple linear models, it will tell you, uh, you'll overestimate vote share there by something like 20 or 30 points. And then you both look dumb and misallocate millions of dollars, which is bad. 
Um, all right, so just as I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more about how politics has a lot of structure, uh, there are a lot of deep interactions in politics, as the Bayesians would like to put it. And so uh, what I'm showing here is this is a two-way Clinton vote share and three-way ideology for liberal, moderate, and conservative, broken down by race, religiosity, and education. Our religiosity question here is a little bit weird, but it's relatively common in the political science literature, where you just ask people their attitudes toward the Bible, uh, where your options are the Bible is a literal word of God, the inspired word of God, or a book of fables written by man. Uh, it's a, they're each, all three options are roughly equally common, and it correlates a lot better with vote choice than a lot of other things like church attendance. And so a couple of I could talk about this particular table for a really long time, but there are a couple of super interesting things that that pop up. The first thing is if you look among white people, uh, generally speaking, uh, being more secular makes you uh, substantially more uh, democratic. Um, uh, but if you look among African Americans, uh, obviously the range is much more restricted, but generally speaking, being more religious actually makes you more Republican. And uh, uh, sorry, uh, being more secular makes you more Republican. And you know, I think this really highlights the extent to which all of these relationships that we that we look at in politics are actually historically contingent. You know, that one of the big reasons why this is true is that you know, in the U.S., um, it, uh, among you know, generally uh, ch white churches tend to be pretty conservative, but in uh, you know, in places like the South. Uh, African American churches play a huge role in Democratic Party organizing and GOTV, and you know that's one of the big reasons why you know we see that reversal. Another example of deep interactions I think is interesting is that generally speaking, uh, being more educated um, among uh, you know being more educated among uh, white people makes you more democratic. But if you already are very religious then actually being more educated makes you more conservative because it means that you follow politics more closely and you just kind of know, ah, I'm very religious. I'm supposed to be a Republican. Uh, and then I think the other thing that's super interesting here is really this interplay um, wh where, you know, partisanship and ideology seem like very similar concepts, but this really, you know, this table really highlights that they can really diverge in a bunch of similar ways, uh, sorry, in a bunch of interesting ways. Like partisanship is clearly not exchangeable by race. You know, almost every category among African Americans uh, ranged between, you know, 94 and 97 percent, while for white people it was between uh, 15 and 75. But you know, when you look at identifying as liberal as opposed to voting for a Democrat, then actually these two columns uh, look relatively exchangeable. That being more being more secular or having a degree doesn't necessarily have the same relationships on partisanship uh, among African Americans as it does for white people, but it does actually have fairly similar uh, effects when it comes to identifying as liberal. And all of that, I, I think, you know, I, you could talk about why, but th th this is, I think, something that's really interesting about politics is that you have all of these like uh, related concepts that differ in important ways, and your models need to be quite complex in order to accurately capture them. So this is a different plot. This is from 2012. Um, this is showing the, uh, you know, the Obama campaign's forecasting model, which me and my co-founder played a big role in polling in, uh, versus the Gallup poll. And, you know, one of the things to highlight is that, you know, all of the uh, public opinion is usually quite stable, uh, and that most public polls, you know, just because they control for so few things, are much more volatile um, than, uh, you know, than you'd expect. But the thing that's annoying, um, you know, is that in 20... In 2012, Barack Obama got 52% of the two-party vote. In 2016, Hillary Clinton got 51.1%. Uh, and so that was really only a 0.9% change over four years. But obviously, that 0.9% really made a big difference. And this is one of the things that really makes what we do very hard. That, you know, in our at our firm, we try to measure two things, changes in public opinion over time, and also the extent to which uh, treatments and arguments change people's minds. Both of these effects are very small, but it turns out are actually very important. So this is a screenshot uh, of our treatment library where, you know, we've tested where we make available, you know, to a bunch of our clients uh, a really large uh, battery of different messages that we've tested. And something uh, that you can see here is that some messages really are much more effective than other messages. This is showing the average treatment effect uh, on Senate vote choice among non-voters. And you can see COVID lockdowns forever, very unpopular. If anyone runs for office, don't campaign on that. Um, all right. Uh, so just to get through some fun technical details of how things actually work, 
all our production models are Bayesian, or at least approximate Bayes. Um, you know, our traditional modeling and our heterogeneous treatment effect modeling, um, you know, generally involve millions of rows, thousands of treatments. Uh, and also our non-experimental causal inference is also, also Bayesian, as is our time series modeling. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, I mean, Stan was mentioned earlier here, uh, you know, we, our big thing is that we try to fit the big Bayesian models that people do use Stan for, but we use uh, variational inference to try to approximate it. Um, it's very hard. Variational inference is painful, um, but that's kind of what we do. And uh, this is just showing, you know, our mean, mean squared error, this cycle versus 538, which just kind of goes to show that all of this different work, all of this extra work really does make things better, but that things are still quite hard. Um, so just to talk through, and this is, I believe, the last slide, just to talk through some challenges um, in this field. You know, the first thing uh, is that business, and I, I suspect that this generalizes outside of politics, but I've only ever worked in politics, so I don't know. Um, the first thing is that business questions from clients usually uh, are not well-defined statistical questions. Uh, it'll be things like, what do we do about Georgia? Or, you know, uh, what candidates should we try to nominate? Or uh, how do we respond to this thing that Trump just did? And, uh, you know, most of the time that is not something that corresponds exactly to fitting a predicted model or doing a randomized controlled trial. Um, but if you focus, on really well-defined, easy to measure problems, then you really end up leaving most of your, you limit your relevance and leave most of your impact on the table. Um, even when things are well-defined, like you have $300 million and you need to allocate them across, you know, allocate that across media mar markets to maximize your expected Senate seat, your answers still realistically probably depend on a bunch of parameters that there is no way you can accurately know. Uh, or, I mean, you could do your best. Uh, and so, but the most important thing, uh, you know, that, and at least what I found is that it's really important to be willing to make leaps in order to avoid decision paralysis. Decision paralysis is really bad. Um, uh, the other thing I've no you know, that I've noticed is that decision makers usually lack background in social science and, statist and statistics. Um, but the flip side is that they're still usually quite smart and ignoring them is a bad idea. Just to tell, you know, some anecdotes about this, I think back a lot to 2012. In the 2012 campaign, the analytics team was just this incredibly young group of people. I was 20, my boss was maybe like 23 or 24. And then there were like these posters on the world that were on the wall that were like, destroy the consultants, save the world. Because the consultants, you know, there were these older people, you know, who'd been working in politics for 20 years. They had been Clinton hands and, you know, I hated them. Uh, and I, I just, looking back, you know, 10 years later, I think that probably even though they, didn't know statistics or didn't know, you know, didn't know math. I think like maybe like of all the things that I disagreed with them on, I think looking back, I think they were right on maybe like 80% of the things. And that's because, you know, it turns out uh, wisdom is important, experience is important. It's very hard to get to the top of a high stat of a of an organization. It's a high status job. And ignoring what they say, it's like really easy. I feel like I talk to people, data people all the time, and they're just like, oh, we need to have a data person in the room. You know, these people just don't get data. And my experience is that usually uh, if you're saying something like that, there's something wrong with what you're doing, and you should like analyze, you should, you should think critically. Like I my my I, I don't know. So, uh, and then the last thing I'm going to say is that democratic politics um, is highly decentralized. And yet, you know, you have these hundreds of races and thousands of different groups. They're all uh, theoretically all trying to do the same thing. Um, but in my experience, uh, they don't ever talk to each other. Uh, like you'd really be like if you, you if, uh, if you can imagine two important, uh, you know, democratic politicians who you imagine ha have like a weekly or monthly meeting, they almost certainly do not. Uh, coordination is just like a very hard problem in general, and it just means that it's really impossible to have impact at scale, and that's, you know, something that we think quite about, think quite a bit about. And all right, with, uh, with that, that's my talk. Uh, thank you so much for listening, uh, and I'll end it there. <laughs>